He never stops to amaze us every moment of the day. Amen. Do you believe that our God is alive? Yes. Amen. How many of you would say that your God is alive even this morning? Yes. Why did I say that? Because every one of us have an experience even coming to the church. And we know that God is indeed active you know, in His work. Amen. He encourages us. Amen. He gives us a word when we are discouraged. He is always there, active to do His work for His love, of, because of His love for His children. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Good morning. Good morning. It's sure that all of us are alive. And <laughs> I'll try to connect to you. I was trying to upload something that uh, I would flash, you know, on the screen, but I don't know if they have done that. But anyway, let's proceed to the Word of God. Amen? I believe that the Word, is, uh, the word of God is anointed. Amen. Amen. The Word of God is what we need. I mean, we believe that. Last Friday, uh, I had the privilege of being with some of our women in the church. Uh, we went to Orange County. And uh, that's near Angeles City, if ever you did not know where it is. Our purpose is uh, to attend the Brilliance Conference for Women. <laughs> Remember, it's the Brilliance Conference for Women. I want to emphasize that. Maybe you would ask, wait, Pastor Gander, it's, you said it's for women. Why were you there? Well, <clears throat> let me give you an answer for that. First of all, you could say that I'm a male person. That's my gender. And I choose to remain to be a man, never entertaining or intending to change my gender. <laughs> and it will remain that way until I will be transferred into glory. Amen. Amen. <laughs> well, I, my intention was not really to attend the conference, but I just wanted to serve them. So I volunteer as one of their drivers. So that's why I was there. Well, I did not regret being with them. I enjoyed their company, hearing their laughter as they were sharing their stories inside the van. <laughs> Thank you, women, for making life in the van. <laughs> Were you able to upload it or no? Okay. And, you know, I, I, so, so much, so much fun. I even enjoyed Melanie's, uh, Melanie's creativeness, you know, in transforming uh, old pictures to look like 10 years younger by using an iPhone app, apps. Uh, I don't know if we could flash it. Can we flash it? There you go. You know who is that? That's my wife. That's the original. And this is the younger version. You see? Ten years younger. <laughs> well, I, I intentionally want to upload more pictures, but, uh, you know, we're not able to do that. So I just make my wife as an example. And I, don't, I, I, I hope you don't mind. <laughs> you see, there was a lot of fans, you know, inside. And everyone were just laughing, uh, wanting to do it too to their own pictures so that they could upload it in their FB, uh, FB sites and make it as a profile picture. Okay, that's enough. <laughs> Take it out from the screen. <laughs> well, one of the highlights in being with them was that Delicious lunch. It's Dr. Karongkong is not here. But it was suggested by Dr. Karongkong. And, and, and it's so good. We were able to eat uh, 
I would say healthy food. It could pass the Daniel's, what's that? Daniel's plan. Okay. Just the 10% of everything, right? Boom. Okay, good. <laughs> but you know, we were not able to reach there without some ob- obstacles. <clears throat> to some of you who knew, we celebrated our 28th year anniversary last Thursday. And still counting. <laughs> and so that delicious lunch was an extension of our celebration. <laughs> the obstacle I encountered was I got lost. I missed the exit going towards the restaurant. So I drove several miles you know, and exit another, uh, and then and go another exit. But thank God for GPS. Amen. Amen. Built-in GPS in your iPhone. So I turn it on, and I carefully look at it, observing the streets I was in at that moment, and then meticulously following the details in that GPS. Now I learned from the trip that because of my receptiveness, remember that word. Receptiveness to the guidance of the GPS, I was able and confidently and certain that I will reach my destiny. In some way, this lesson is true to our Christian walk. Amen. This is true when we want to hear the Lord speak to us. This is true when we need guidance in our relationship with Him. This is true when we desire to live a life pleasing to Him. It is the Word of God that helps us in our Christian walk, and God speaks to us through His written Word. How many of you agree with that? He teaches us through the Word to live a life pleasing to Him, because the Word of God gives us guidance. Amen. The Word of God gives us guidance. So this morning, we wanted to look into the Scriptures how the Word of God is vital in our being. How it is to be regarded and how beneficial it is for our spiritual development and stability. I will present this truth by observing passages in the Scriptures that describes the use of the, word, ter, uh, the, term, word, the term Word of God. And this means that when we read a certain passage, we will try to examine the original form of the translated word, which is the word of God, and how the word is used, and how it was applied in a given situation. So this morning, I am give, I'm submitting to you the title of this message, The Word of God in 3D. <laughs> or in three dimensions. The Word of God in three dimensions. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for today. We can come before you. We can be certain that the Holy Spirit is working in our lives today. <clears throat> And we pray, O oh God, that your anointed word will give us life. Meet those who have needs this morning. We'll satisfy the longings of the soul. And Father, we give you the praise, the glory, and the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Three dimensions in the word of God. The first is the equipping word of God. The equipping word of God. Now, in the, original, in the original text, this is the one that is interpreted as logos. What is logos? Word that is referred principally to, a total, to the total inspired word of God. So the Bible that you are holding on, the Bible that you're reading from your iPhones, that's logos, the written word of God. Let's turn our Bibles to 2 Timothy 3, 15 to 17. And we'll see how... These verses are applied as the Logos. 2 Timothy 3, 15 to 17 says, You have been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood, and they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize What is wrong in our lives? It straightens us out and teaches us to do what is right. 
It is God's way of preparing us in every way, fully equipped for every good things God wants us to do. I would say that the Bible is the first and the easiest way to hear from the Lord. The Bible, the scriptures, and is to be our guideline in having a relationship with Him. Amen. Many of you probably are still confused of, you know, how to have that relationship go uh, uh, flourish, you know, uh, husbands and wife, you know, relationship with children and the parents, a relationship with one another. If we are, if we perceive the Word of God as important, you know, in that aspect of our relationship, then you go and get your guidance from Him, from the Word of God. Amen. When we are longing to, over, uh, to receive God's voice and begin to hear it in various ways. Like I'll be preaching today, you hear my word. But not everything I would say, you will agree. But you will find that my preaching in the word is according to God's word, the written word of God. Then you, will, you are confident that I'm telling to you what is true. Everything has to be. Validated, they must be conformed to the written word of God. Now, there are times that the Lord speaks to us through dreams. Amen. Or an idea would flash from our mind while reading a book. Or an impression on our hearts while listening to somebody speaking to us. And we receive those forms of voices as God's way of showing to us the answer. Again, I would say... It must be conformed by the written word of God. Amen. To Timothy, my dear son. Let's open our Bibles to 2 Timothy 1 verses 2 10. And this is how the word of God is applied by the apostle Paul in encouraging Timothy, his young disciple. The word says to Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve as my ancestor did with a clear conscience. As night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith which first lived in your grandmother, Louise, and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the living, through the laying on of my hands. For the spirit God gives us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us to be holy to, to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of His own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, 2 Timothy 1, verses 2 to 10. That's the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul talking to his young disciple, Timothy. So, reminding him of his faith and heritage. Faith and heritage. First thing I see here is that from childhood, we discover that Timothy was trained from the Word of God. He gave, I would say the parents of Timothy gave, you know, that importance of how the Word of God can really shape his, his children. I would say. From the admonition of Paul, he reminded him, he, you've been taught of the Word of God since childhood. What would this mean to us today? It means that the Word of God is very important 
even in nurturing our next generation. If you have not started to let the Word of God as your primary guide in teaching, in nurturing, in disciplining the next generation, then probably we will not be able to see the experience of Timothy as Paul described in this particular chapter. I grew up in a Christian family, but it does not mean that I am a Christian. My dad was a pastor. He was a blind evangelist. Many of you heard that, that testimony. But he never, in, 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 my growing, in my growing years, he never failed to let us read the Word of God. His way of doing that is this, because he was blind, so he wanted, to, uh, he wanted to study the Word of God, so it was passed to us, his children, who have our eyes to read, because he can't read. So we are forced to read. But I'm glad that we are forced to read, because if not that discipline, I will not be able to know the Word of God today. It started there. And I, he, I, I, I saw the heritage that, are, uh, that, that, that has planted an influence in my life even today. Shaped in my life. And I believe that that same principle, as Paul admonished and encouraged Timothy, is the same principle that we can receive today. Perceive that the Word of God is what you need to teach your next generation. Know that the Word of God has power to change the life of the next generation. The first thing I saw there. So he reminded Timothy of the teachings he received way back from his grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice. Paul reminded him at that time he was with him in their missionary journey. How the Word of God encourages them and how powerful and how stable it is. The word of God became the foundation of his faith. The basis of his conduct of living. The word of God is the source of encouragement in his journey. That made him faithful in the work God has called him to do. And the word of God sustained him to endure hardship. Not giving up his faith. But persevered in proclaiming continually the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. To everyone that God allowed him to meet and know. It is the word of God. Without the logos, without the written word of God, we will be lost. I understand that the world can offer us many things, advices. But those advices, is, if it's not conformed to the primary source that we are holding as we walk in our journey as a Christian, in, in Christian life, then we will fail. Because there is nothing comparison and there is nothing that could be over the word of God. Amen. Now to understand fully, Timothy, when this was written by Paul, was pastoring the church in Ephesus. And Paul was writing the epistle while he was in prison in Rome. Now, with that background, we know that Rome was set on fire, was burned. The city of Rome was burned in 64 AD. And since, the, the, since Rome was burned in 64 AD, since that day, the emperor, and during that time it was Emperor Nero, he, he blamed the Christians as the culprit of what the city, why the city was burned. So during that time, to be a Christian is dangerous. During that time, it was dangerous to be a Christian or to be in contact with the leaders of Christianity like the Apostle Paul. And because of the situation, many Christians, including some of Paul's workers or co-workers, opted to seek a much lower profile and become less aggressive in their ministry involvement. That was the background. Timothy faced temptation to do the same. 
But here Paul comes, said, Timothy, I am comforting you to remain faithful to your calling. To be loyal to me. Timothy, you needed to stand shoulder to shoulder with me strong and the other believers and to continue to preach the word as he had done. It seems today, it seems that in the mind of Timothy, the persecution of Christians is getting stronger. And they are in danger of discouragement, settled fast, uh, danger and discouragement settled fast into his being. Fear overpowers his desire to continue in the ministry and timidity began to set in. And Paul reminded Timothy how the Lord works when confronted with that situation. The voice of the Lord will not give you the spirit of fear. It will not encourage you to be timid. For the spirit of God in you will give you the power, the love, and self-discipline. Now in times of our discouragement, that's true. Sometimes we are fearful. Sometimes we are timid because of our situations. But you know what? When God speaks to you, He will not speak to you that brings fear. He will not speak to you that will let you be timid. If you are experienced that, when in times of crisis in your life, that means to say that the devil is behind it. Amen. The enemy of our soul is the one behind it. Because God... The spirit that God gives us is not a spirit of fear. It's not a spirit of timidity, but it's a spirit of power, love, and self-discipline. Amen. Today, the word of God has the same power to equip you to be strong. Amen. If you are discouraged, His voice will not make you fearful to your circumstances. His voice will not promote, will not promote timidity, but He will encourage you to stand firm. It will give you boldness to be strong in the Lord in the midst of discouraging situation. Again, because the spirit in us that God gave will give us power, love, and discipline. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. So, when in situation like Timothy, do not be victim of going through a spiritually dry season. You know, I don't want to go there. You know why? Because I'm so discouraged. You know, and then you find yourself that even reading the Word of God, you lose the appetite. So you are going through a spiritually dry, a spiritual dry season. Do not wait for the time to come. It's just like in the, in the writings of the prophet Amos. And that is in Amos chapter 8, verses 11 to 12. The Word of God says, and Amos, this is a warning <coughs> to Amos. Uh, he was given to the people of Israel. He said, the days are coming, declares the sovereign Lord, when I will send a famine through the land, not a famine of food or a thirst for water, but a famine for hearing the word of the Lord. There is a famine that will, what, that will sit in, in our hearts if we are not going you know, to thirst for God's word in our hearts and our lives. So do not wait for that to come. In times of circumstances, you have to stand up. And like Paul, he encourages Timothy to stand up firm, you know, by remembering the instructions. By remembering the word that was planted in his heart from his grandmother and his mother. The same thing, you have to remind yourself that the word of God is already settled in my heart. Amen. In times of dry season, words from God become few and scattered. And finally, far between. You hold on to other things. You hold on to the books probably that you're reading which are not based or can, it, can, can never help us grow spiritually. We can be entertained by many things for the sake of unwinding ourselves because of the hurts. And then you forget to return to the Word of God. The weariness of life settles in and you are spiritually sleepy and your appetite for the Word of God shuts down. 
Your hunger for righteousness is fading away without notice. You're spiritually dry. This morning, the Word of God is reminding us to be awakened. Amen. To be awakened. To thirst one more time. To equip ourselves with the Logos, the written Word of God. It will equip us it will equip us in our, it, it will equip us how to handle things and situations in life. It will find strength, it will find nourishment into our spiritual life. It will help us to go on going through the circumstances of life still joyful and happy. If you have been experiencing a famine and want to break out of it, and become excited about reading the Word of God, just ask Him for help. Amen? Living the life He desires for us is impossible without His help. We simply cannot do it on our own. But know that the Lord never intended you to live independently from Him. In understanding, in hearing, in pleasing, and knowing Him. No, He never intended you to be an independent. But He intended for you to trust Him, to commune with Him, to have an intimate relationship with Him in times of troubles because He is there and is willing to minister to you. The equipping Word of God. Second one is the empowering Word of God. Empowering Word of God refers from the original text as Rima. That is spoken word. Spoken word that brings life into your soul at that moment. A spoken word that made alive. A rima. That could be a verse or a portion of scripture that the Holy Spirit will use to bring to our attention with application to that current situation, whatever you have. So the word of God that is quickened it becomes a personal word that spoke to you or speaks to you personally it gives power at that moment that's the empowering word of God the rima word of God I believe that God speaks to us at any time when he chooses to reveal something many times he speaks to us while we are reading the Bible through verses that seem tailored for a particular situation. This verse will stand out among the verses you read and it becomes alive in you. Your immediate response is to say, Yes, Lord. Yes, thank you for showing me the answer. Thank you for encouraging me from my situation. Or when you hear the word, it gives you life. It will excite you and you act upon that alive word that you receive. I heard so much testimony, and, and uh, Sister Lot is here, can testify. In her situation, God gave her a word. And that word is that you will not die, but you are going to live. You will be among the living, not among the dead. Amen. And hold on. She hold on to that word. She hold on to that word until now she's still here serving the Lord. Amen. That word becomes a rima in her life. And he hold on to the word. Many of you have experiences in your life. I have my own experience. And I hold what God told me at that moment. And that word became alive. And it gives me strength. Hallelujah. Yes, God still speaks and His empowering word will encourage you and me. Amen. Two Sundays ago, you hear Jory stand here. How many of you remember that? He had a spoken word. And that spoken word is about worship. While he was doing that spoken word, you know, I can sense that the Spirit of God was so strong already inside this building. 
And I know that every one of you also feel that sense, you know, of the awesome presence of the Holy Spirit. And so I received a word when he spoke a certain portion of that, uh, of that spoken word. He said, when you worship God, okay, give the best you can. Because when you worship Him, He will, you know, give, he will give you the... Uh, I'll give you, but he will inhabit in the in the worship of his people. And now, while he was talking about you know all all these words, you know that implies to giving your best to worship the Lord. Just right here, I was standing behind him, and the Lord reminded me of Psalms twenty nine two. And it becomes a rima to me that when you worship the Lord, this is what Psalms twenty nine two says: you have to ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. What is the glory that's due to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? Everything, everything, the best that you can to, 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 to express your worship unto Him. Expression of the glory of His name. And He said, worship the Lord in the splendor of His holiness. Wow. In the awesomeness of the holiness of God. We cannot fully understand the holiness of God. We cannot. But I know and I understand as the Bible says and as the Bible describes that when people are in the, are experiencing in the splendor, in the majesty of holiness, they just bow down. They just worship. And even they could see themselves, oh, I am a sinner. I am not worthy to be with your presence. That's the awesomeness of the presence of God. That's when you experience the, experience the holiness of God. It drives you to realize that with you and God, you are not in comparison. Nothing you can do but just bow down and worship Him. Because of His holiness. You see, Rima word is real time message. It's just something you think. At that moment, boom! There's a real time message from God through the Bible or through listening the preaching of a pastor or through meditation or devotional time or through watching someone else doing the work of God. God uses those medium of communications to give life at that moment, but everything has to be confirmed by the Logos Word of God. If you've, even, if you've ever been reading the Bible and a verse has particularly leaped off the page at you as if God, by His Holy Spirit, was speaking directly to you, then you have a Rima word from the Lord. What is the word of God telling you today? What is it that God is speaking to you today? I want you to, I want you to hold on to that. If it gives life to you at this moment, I want you to hold on to that. I want you to, 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 to say, Lord, I believe this is an answer of what I needed. God, I believe that you're showing me this way. Hold on to the river word of God. It will encourage you. Amen. Amen. In the scriptures, there's a certain example, and that is in... In the story of uh, Peter, the experience of Peter, uh, when Jesus asked him to set his sail again on the lake and throw the net to catch fish. And that is in Luke 5, 1 to 11. <clears throat> Let's read that. Luke 5, 1 to 11. One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Genesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water edge... Uh, a water's edge, two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water and let down the nets for, its a, for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. 
When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled with bo both bo boats to fall, to so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' feet, at Jesus' knees, and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the cuts of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partner. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will be fish. You will fish for people. So they pulled their boat, boats up on shore, left everything and followed him. Look at this experience. How many of you watched the movie Son of God? Have you watched the movie Son of God? This particular scenario you know, in the scripture was portrayed by that. And this is how they portrayed Peter. Peter was projected as tired while washing the nets, the nets and ready to hang them for the next fishing schedule. Then Jesus came and instructed him to sail, to sail the boat into the lake once again and throw the net to catch fish. Oh, Peter was so honest. He said, Lord, we've been working all night. Nothing. There's no catch. And then Jesus said, Do it. Put out into the waters and let down the net for a catch. And so Peter responded, you know, his honesty, tired, but somewhere in his spirit, when Jesus says something, he obeyed. When I can picture it, I can, when, when I picture that in my own situation, it's, it's just like this. I'm so discouraged. I've been dead tired for the whole day. And then I read the word, and then there's this Rima word of God. Even though I'm tired, I would be forced to. I would be forced to pray for a burden that the Lord gave me even though I was tired. Even though I was discouraged. I would pray for the person that God put in my mind. Even if it's 1 o'clock in the morning. Even if it's 2 o'clock in the morning. I would stand up even though I'm tired and just respond to what the word says. To what the burden says. I obeyed. And then I see the miracle after that. I wake up in the morning just having two hours sleep, but still I'm still awake and strong. That's the first thing you would notice. Now maybe you, this is not the same experience with you, but that's how I experience, that's how personally God deals with me. And when God gives me a word, I am quickened. And I know that God can all, is, is also touching you, and God is also speaking through you through a word. You know, even though you are dead tired, even though Peter was so discouraged by the situation, uh, putting the nets out there whole night, nothing, is cut, uh, not, not, nothing cuts. But then Jesus said, do it so. And so Peter said, so, okay, Lord, it's you who said, I'll do it. That word gives a spark to Peter's tiredness. It lighted his weary body. And that's how the spoken word of God will do to you even today. Amen. It gives life at real time in your situation. The Holy Spirit will give fire to the words to hear, to hear and it will bring life unto, your, unto you personally. Now, in, in the regular course of our study reading of God's word, which is the, in, in the equipping word of God or the logos, we need to ask God to speak to us through his word and give us insight into it. The Holy Spirit can cause certain passages to stand out with significant meaning or application for our lives. As what I said, these are the rima 
of the scriptures and should become a part of our daily thoughts and actions. Because without that encouraging word, the powerful, of, powerful word of God, we cannot be strong. We can easily be fallen from any situations in our life. I would like to take this principle. In what our church is envisioning to do. Let's go to Isaiah 60, 22. And in Deuteronomy 1, 11. <clears throat> Isaiah 60, 22 says, The least of you will become a thousand. The smallest, a mighty nation. I am the Lord and it's time I will do this swiftly. Let's go to the next verse. May the Lord, the God of your fathers, increase you a thousand times and bless you as he has promised. I would say God loves us all. As a church. God loves you and me. God loves Holy Ground Family Fellowship of America. Amen. That he placed his overseer, he placed his overseer in this ministry to guide us and lead us. The verse that we just read a while ago was a revelation from God given to our senior pastor Eddie while he was reading the scriptures in one of his time of meditations. The word of God has read that was read became a rima word to him. And he passed on this vision to us. And this morning, you know, I am including this in my service because this is the word of God for us to have an ownership this morning. Amen. God said that he will give us a thousand. It started with his servant. That's how God operates. And that becomes a vision to this church already. And I want you to cut on the vision because... You know, this is how God operates. This is how God operates. The process that we need to understand. When God directs His work, He gives vision. Without vision, people perish. He gives this vision either out from a burden that the Lord will impress in your heart or out from your reading of the scriptures. The next thing he will do is to use people to fulfill the vision. He will use people to confirm the word, the Rima word that becomes a vision. And so when a vision is shared, we need to cut that personally and ask God, in what way I can be of help? In what way, Lord, I could help, you know, of this vision? You know what? You have all the time to come and realizing the vision that this is the vision of the church. You have all the time to come into the altar where God can speak to you. God, I need a Rima word so that I could participate in this vision. How many of you believe that? Because the work of God is not a work of one person. And when God orchestrates, He orchestrates everybody. Amen. He orchestrates the people that are in that organization. So every one of us can participate and that vision will be fulfilled as God enables us, as His Word empowers us, as the Word of God, which is the Rima Word of God, we continue to hold on to it until the fulfillment of the Word will be materialized. Greater things are yet to come and greater things are still to be done in the cities of Clovis and Fresno. And let's all be excited to be channel of this wonderful work God has directed us as a church. No time to be discouraged. No time to let the devil get into the holes of our discouragement.
And I'm certain that this will, be, this will be fulfilled. How many of you feel that in your hearts? And I don't want you just to feel it in your hearts, but I want you to believe that. Look at this word of God. Luke 137. And I pray that this will be a rima to you this morning. The word of God says, For nothing is impossible with God. Amen. Let's say that. It's one of us. Just read the screen. You know, and make that as a rima word in our lives. For nothing is impossible with God. I want to look at the NLT version. You know, if we have an in, in, NLT, it, it, it's so good. You know, it, it's so different with the NIV. Okay. Oh, it's the same thing? Luke 137. For nothing is impossible with God. Oh, what's this version? Okay. Anyway, another version that I would give to you is this. Oh, this is American Standard Version. It says, For no word from God shall be void of power. No word from God shall be void of power. Other version says, For the word of God will never fail. Now, don't base on the feeling what we shared to you as the vision. Because God indeed, when He gave it His word, He is going to be accountable of it. Not because, you know, you are God, you are accountable. To, but God says it, and when He says so, it will be accomplished. Amen. Amen. For He promised that the Word of God will never fail. This is just assurance that nothing is impossible with God. Our faith in Jesus Christ is not an aberration or, or, or a mental state that is different from the norm. But it is authentic. Amen. The authenticity of the Word of God is not born out of what you hear, but what you personally experience. The validity of it as how the other believers also experience it. A witness of two or three validates the testimony of a person. So the Word of God is authentic and powerful and indeed never fails. Hallelujah. Last one is the incarnate Word person. Talk about the logos, the empowering living word of God. We talked about Rima, the powerful spoken word of God. The last one is the incarnate word. Let's go to Revelations 19, 11 to 13. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice, he judges and makes war. Continue. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. Last verse. He is dressed in a robe deep in blood, and his name is what? The word. the word of God. And his name is the Word of God. We know that in John chapter 1, verse 1, the Word of God says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then in verse 12, this Word what? Became flesh and dwelled among us. He dwelt among us. Jesus, the incarnate word of God. Let's go to Revelation. The verse, first verse. It says, Whose rider is called faithful and true. Verse 11. I said verse 11. Whose rider is called faithful and and true. I, I, I look at <clears throat> some of our experiences. When we idolize somebody in our life, we are mostly drawn to a person because of the personality and charisma. Right? He has a good personality. 
He has a good charisma. When I am with him, he can speak. He can encourage. He is, there's no dull moment. He is the life of the party. That draws us closer to a person. And we idolize that person. Some are attracted when they see the integrity of the person. He followed him for a certain period of time and discovered that his life is marked with consistency. His life inside a home is the same life he demonstrated in the public. He is a man of words, a man of integrity. In the word that we read, described as the word of God, an attribute or the attributes is there. And what is the attribute of this person, the incarnate word? He is what? Faithful and true. He is faithful and true. That means to say that the one who promises, the one who guides through the living word, the one who gives the rima word to light up, you know, the, to light up your discouraged life, the one who gives us the promise is faithful and true. That means to say there is nothing in him that is fake. There is nothing in him that is false, that is broken, but authentic. When he promised, he fulfills. Amen. Amen. Looking at John, speaking about the vision he saw, he spoke with accuracy that this is he who authored salvation. This is Jesus who authored salvation. This is the one who died on the cross of Calvary for the forgiveness of sin. This is the one also who one day will come to engage war against the devil and forever he will be defeated. We look at some symbols. You know, he said, I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse. Try to look what symbolizes a white horse. Remember he is faithful. Remember he is true. But a white horse symbolizes victory. A white horse symbolizes victory over one's enemy. His eyes it's like a blazing fire. What does that mean? It suggests that he is piercing judgment of sin and takes everything into account. That means to say he is a loving God, but at the same time, he is a just God. He never tolerates sin in our lives. He is the author of salvation, but he is also what? Accounts. He will account us of our doings, our works here on earth. Faithful and true, not fake. It's that one word here, and in the other time, it's another word. No, he is consistent. When he says he's the righteous God, he is the righteous one. When he says he will judge, he will judge. I remember Psalms, where can I hide myself or hide myself? Not even from your presence, even if I'll go to the deepest part of the earth I cannot hide from you because you are looking to me blessing fire what else his many diadems he said his many diadems or crowns of royalty that symbolizes his right to rule the world as king of kings now I want you to see, you know, the one that encourages us with the word of God, the one that gives us word that gives uh, the, the, the one that gives word that gives us life is faithful and true. He is the author of salvation. He has been crowned with many diadems, not because he married, not, not, not because you know he is he's just the king of kings and the lord of lords, but he is indeed has the right to rule over the world. It's not because of his title, but because of who he is that is embodied in his being a word of God. That is his attribute. 
This is the Christ who refused the diadem when it was offered to him by the tempter. When Satan said to him, I will give you all the kingdoms if you only bow down before me. But was crowned on the merit of his victorious passion. And now appears wearing one, not just one, but many crowns. The incarnate word, the incarnate word of God is the head of the church. He is the, he is the Lord. Of lords, he is the king of kings, he is the mediator between God and man who can forgive sin. Angels and saints bow before him, and those who follow are clothed in purity and righteousness. The powers of earth and hell tremble at the mention of that name. The word of God is alive today and reminds us that in him is in him is your delight, and nothing impossible is impossible with him. The encouraging word, the powerful word, the incarnate word. Looking at all these dimensions, there's only one thing I could say. In our situation, He is all what we need. When we need guidance, He is all what we need. When you need wisdom, He is all what you need. Amen? And remember, He is a loving God who died for us so that our sins can be forgiven. But remember too that He is a God who sees us and He will judge us according to what we do. submit to you today that you know let's love the word of God Amen. let's come and have confidence in the word of God Amen. when we have needs turn not to anybody turn to the word of God Amen. it has the answer may we are encouraged today that how the word of God reminded us Father, thank you so much for your love and faithfulness. Thank you because you are indeed true and faithful. You never fail us, O Lord God. Yes, we always recognize that many times we fail you. But God, in your attributes, you are a faithful God. You are a true God. You are able, O Lord God, even... To encourage us in the deepest hours of our lives. There is nothing impossible with you. Your word is true. It will, be, it will accomplish, oh God, what you have promised. It will be accomplished what you have promised. And help us to have that confidence today. That we are serving an incarnate living God. We are guided by the living equipping word of God. And we are made alive by the Rima, powerful, spoken word of God. Thank you so much, Heavenly Father. To you belongs all the praise, the glory, and the honor. Amen. I'm blessed this morning. Hallelujah, amen. This morning I was praying for our church service. God spoke to my heart, and I believe this is a remus what Pastor Gunder was saying in the message. And I believe it spoke to me and it will speak to you as well. It's been a while that I came across with this verse. But suddenly it came back to me this morning while I was praying for today's morning service. In Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17, King James Version, the Lord has spoken and says, The Lord your God is in your midst. 
a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. I read again, I meditated again, again, and again for a few minutes. And then it came to me that the God who is in the midst of us, is He in the midst of us? Yeah. Where two or three are gathered in His name, there He is in the midst of them. And I said, Lord, the God who is in the midst of us, number one, is mighty. Yeah. He is mighty to save. He is mighty to deliver. He is mighty to give a solution to your problems. Who is this God in the midst of His people? He will rejoice over you with gladness. This God is a happy God. This God is joyful. And He wants to give that joy to you this morning, regardless of your situation. Who is this God in the midst of His people? He is the God who knows how to quiet you down with his love. Amen. Is your life messed up? Are you loud? With all these worries and concern, his compassion will quiet you down. Who is this God in the midst of his people? He will exalt over you with loud singing. Let the word of God speak to you this morning, church. Let us respond to the word of the Lord today. There might be some of us who need to come to the altar to surrender something to the Lord, to receive a word from God, to receive the Logos, to receive a Rema, that equipping word, that powerful word, that incarnate word to be a reality in your life today. No matter what your situation, no matter what your circumstances, the Word is powerful. God's Word is not void of power. It is working even now. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld this glory, the glory of the only begotten Son of God. As we sing this song once again, Please come to the altar and bring your need. You want revival? You want spiritual revival? You are so dry in the spirit. Now is the opportunity to be refreshed. Let God come. Let His word revive your soul. Amen. Let the word of God revive your soul. Are you drifting away? Let the word of God bring you closer to Him. Let the power of God's word quicken your soul.
Jesus.